Well, good evening, friends. Welcome to another edition of the Mystery Wine Blind Tasting here at Field in Maine. Joined by all of you, hopefully, uh, in your homes, on your vacations, wherever you are that you're taking the Mystery Wine. And to all those guests that don't necessarily have the wine, you're welcome, of course, to join us and play along and use the comments that the other tasters and myself are offering up to formulate your own idea of what happens to be in this glass or behind the brown bag that is here. Delighted to be with you. We've had a couple of great uh, weeks here at the restaurant. Last night I had a fantastic evening with uh, the folks from Early Mountain Vineyards uh, who are celebrating their 10th anniversary. We were joined by Eileen uh, Xavier, who, who does all things kind of outreach and forward thinking, strategic planning, uh, marketing, and uh, she was with us to kind of walk us through a whole series of wines, uh, including a fantastic seminar on Cabernet Franc. And Jean Case was in house last night as well, and uh, that was very special to hear what she had to say about the the last ten years or so of, of Early Mountains Rise, and uh, and in particular got a chance to try the 2019 Rise. And Peter Hun was also in house too, the CEO of Early Mountain, who uh, was the person who first believed in me as a consultant um, when I started Fable Hospitality and brought me on as a consultant for Early Mountain years ago. So it was a meaningful and uh, moving night, some great food and some wonderful wine. And we're on to another night at Field Main here with more wonderful wine. I know Candy and Kevin are joining us. Who else? If you're here, chime in, let me know. Oh, Erica, hello, hello. The Universal Line, and you could join us. That is wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. Um, I think we'll probably be joined too by Kathy in just a moment. I saw her post last night as I was just about to go to bed that she was all ready for this evening's tasting, but had it yesterday. So her wine has been decanted for 24 hours and is ready to roll. Hopefully she'll be joining us too. If you're here, please chime in and let me know as we get started. Yep, part deux. Hi, Kathy. Good evening. That's funny. Um, <laughs> you've got an advance team out for you, right? Tasting in advance. You're really prepared. Very well prepared. We like to be thorough uh, for all tastings. Um, still in the brown bag, that's good. The question really would be how much is still left after you open it if you had the self-constraint, uh, restraint, excuse me, to, uh, to hold back and not consume it all. Hopefully you have a little bit left. Kathleen, hello, hello to you. Great to have you with us too. Um, all right, let's go. We got a little red, kind of uh, smells a little bit fall-like, right? So what do we have here? As you look at the wine, what do you see? Is it a red wine? Yes. And from then on, what are you noticing as you swirl? Are we forming um, tears? And do those tears then stay and linger in the form of legs? And remember what that tells us. David and Allison, hello. Did I just see too that you guys uh, maybe inked something today and made it permanent or very, very, um, very recently got uh, officially married? Is that what happened? If so, congratulations. And on the idea of inking something, yes, there is a little bit of an inky color here, right? So the color is, is it more reddish? Is it more purple? Um, and get some staining, some tears. Yep, Erica, that's right. It's definitely staining, and they're forming tears for me that are moving relatively slow. Uh, they're, not, they're not speeding down, and they're maintaining after they've reached back into the, the bulk of the wine at the base of the, of the glass. And so that's an indication we're talking about a richer, riper varietal potentially here, something that's got a little bit of weight, I, potentially alcohol, as we talked about many, many times. Um, this is a conversation about potential alcohol or sugar, and they're related. And so with fermentation, the ripeness in the grape, ripeness being something that comes traditionally from a warmer place vis-a-vis -vis something that's cooler. So you'd have a lighter wine, relatively speaking, uh, from a cooler space, but that's not always the case. But in terms of being able to narrow things down, um, this is uh, this is pretty pretty much on the more on the robust side of things, um, showcasing those tears, those legs, that inky staining, and that purple profile. Uh, all would suggest we're dealing with something that has a thicker skin, richer, more robust, riper climate potential. Right. So this is we're not saying all of that and then saying I think this might be a cool climate Pinot Noir. So what it, we're saying is more this might be a warmer climate, say Cabernet, or this might be a warmer climate. Petit Verdot or Tanat, something of that sort that has more coloration. David, it's wonderful. Ah, so you've got the marriage license, you're ready to go uh, for the actual celebration and the ceremony. Well, we are very happy for you. Marcy, um, welcome too. Thank you for joining us and appreciate the comment. The, uh, 
the wine is uh, pretty much clear. And is it uh, something where you see any variation from the rim to the center of the bowl, right? So from this point to this point, is there variation? And a variation that's on the rim here along the edge, and I like to look over the top of it, down at it, is that something that showcases for you a change in color, a change in depth. Um, this wine seems to be presenting some of that change, um, but not a lot, right? So what you're looking for principally there is, is there a change in color? More often than not, that change will be something like more like a brownish tinge up to the rim and a kind of lighter core or a core that is deeper core rather and lighter toward the rim. Um, that's an indication perhaps of age. In this wine, I would say it looks relatively youthful because there isn't much of a shift, although there is a tiny bit of a watery meniscus or that, that rim around the outside called a meniscus has almost a little layer of water or a thinness at the end there. It's not colored. That's an indication more often than not too of higher alcohol. And that higher alcohol reflects back to what we're saying about the legs and the tears that we're forming here and the color and that staining. So this is probably something that's got a little bit of warmth and richness and maybe a bit of alcohol, which would be something we would think would come from a warmer climate. So right off the bat, without smelling, without tasting, we know quite a bit about this wine, or we think we do. We're building a profile that should inform what we then smell and taste and either bolster that or become something that we have to rethink. <laughs> Richard, I am not commenting about your knee. No, Richard, I'm talking about wine. So, mm, it smells wonderful. If you haven't smelled it already, give it a smell. And you're looking for a few things as you smell the wine, right? Fruit, earth, and wood. A few things. The fruit, what do you think? It's wonderful, isn't it? It's what kind of fruit is it? So what type of fruit? And then what kind of fruit, i.e., is it a ripe bit of fruit? Is it a raisiny bit of fruit? Is it a, a fruit that has been stewed or cooked? Is it medicinal? Is it tart and underripe? What kind of fruit? And then what kind of fruit is that? And so what's the presentation of that fruit? This is on the riper side, right? Yes, Kathy, thank you. Blackberry jam and bramble fruit. When she says bramble fruit, we're talking about fruit that would grow on a vine and fruit that would grow on a bush. Um, blackberries, raspberries. And oftentimes bramble would refer to something more wild. So not the confectionery element, but something that's got a little bit of a woody note to it and a fruity note to it. Dark fruit coming from Erica, I agree. There's a little cherry there, there's plum, it's ripe. Yeah, yeah, and it's, there's a pure sweetness to the fruit, isn't there? Like um, it is jammy and there, so there's a confectionery cooked and preserved quality, but there's also kind of a layer of just really ripe, pristine, almost uh, an essential quality of the fruit note um, that is both matched with its aroma and its sweetness. So neat, neat wine. Again, all these descriptors are referring to something that has a bit of a thicker skin, a little bit robust, more round and ripe. So I think the nose from the fruit standpoint certainly kind of dovetails with what we've talked about with respect to the visual on the wine. Yes, I agree too, Kathy. Kathy chilled hers to keep it fresh from the opening yesterday, um, but that still hasn't muted the, the flavors. And I would say, yes, it's pretty aromatic and pretty expressive. And so you can ask that question too of yourself. Is this wine very expressive? Is it moderately so? Or is it relatively muted? And that can give you an indication sometimes that the wine might be very youthful. And sometimes wines in their youth are very muted. They have yet to kind of blossom and release what they are. Uh, that's not a perfect tell, right? So if you haven't gotten something that's muted. And on the, right, on the reverse side of things, this wine is relatively expressive and probably also young. So it's not a definite tell on young, but it is a note. Eric, you picking up a little violet? Oh, good. So heading from fruit to earth, do you get anything earthen? Do you get anything that's uh, mineral? Do you get anything that's sort of foresty? Anything that's sort of barnyardy, um, even leathery, uh, for example? Those are the things we're looking for in the way of earth. Maybe a little bit of, uh, of soil, 
but nothing crazy in the way of Earth. Earth. Nothing that's really overt and prominent. And I think that also perhaps reflects back on the idea of its youth. Some wines will certainly present a more advanced profile of secondary or what is called tertiary characteristics that are often more earthy and those earthy notes will come out in time. The, uh, the wines too that from, are from the old world oftentimes present a little bit more earth in profile. This one might not be as earthy and therefore could give you a tell toward the new world. Mm. And then I'm looking for something from the wood camp. Anything woody? And when we say wood, you can smell actual wood, but you can also smell things that result from the use of wood with the wines, either fermentation and or its aging. And so you might get things like dill, you could get things like uh, butterscotch, sometimes you can get things uh, like cedar, and spices, spices like holiday spices. And those are the things that are resulting by way of a barrel being toasted and the sugars that are in the actual oak, wood, or other types of wood potentially too. Um, are caramelized, and those caramel notes, those cooked notes, often present themselves in the way of spices in the wine. Uh, vanilla is another one, of course, uh, which Eric is picking up a little bit of. I get a little bit of, um, it's not a great descriptor, but uh, for those of you that, like me, use a toothpick every once in a while, and like you just chomp on it for a while, and it becomes wet, uh, masticated kind of toothpick wood, uh, that wet wood. I get a little bit of wet wood here. but not a great signature of oak. So this isn't something that, for example, if we had gotten a bunch of sort of bourbon-y vanilla, a whole bunch of American oak signature, and some of the characteristics we were talking about in the terms of red, we might be thinking about something, say, from Rioja, which is famous for using American oak. But there isn't a particular tell here that, um, that talks specifically about one place or another. So we're no further along based on the nose alone. Um, although we are building the same profile in case. So, yay, Chris, more wine, exactly. Chris was with us last evening, and Courtney, his wife, as well, and hopefully she's there, too. Hi, Courtney, if you're there. A touch of cedar. And Marcy, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> I love, love that you're enjoying the comments. And, um, mm. Bourbon-y vanilla starting to come out for you, Erica. Good. Okay, so we're talking about a little, bit of, a little bit of oak usage perhaps, and it's just maybe touch muted and not necessarily fully expressive. I just opened the wine literally before pressing go live, and so advancing a touch, that's the benefit too is uh, as we blind taste and taste these wines, we take a little bit of time with them, and they always change. I was talking to some guests last night, talking about what we do each Thursday, uh, the third Thursday of each month, and talking about how the wine does change more often than not at minute 22 been our sort of witching hour moment but we're at minute 13 and it's definitely starting to open up and evolve a bit more I'm picking up a little bit more raisiny notes and kind of pruny notes and so um, there's a deeper quality to some of that fruit some of that jammy buttery or jammy uh, confectionery kind of note is now moving into dried notes uh, as well it hasn't not to say that the the fruit kind of jam notes aren't also still there they are so let's taste this wine let's see if what we've built up thus far makes sense on the palate. So we should be expecting something that has a robust profile, a richer profile. So in the world of milk, right, we talk about skim milk, 2% and whole milk. This should be more on the whole milk side of the spectrum. We're looking at something that might have a little bit of tannin because it had that staining and those tears and those legs and some body to it. We're looking at something that should have that jammy fruit. Um, and we'll, we'll know a little bit more as we taste to see if we can pin down a little bit more about region, place, and ideally some bridal too. Mm. So that first sip, that first taste, it's difficult not to rush to flavor notes and compounds, but let's focus for a second on the taste. And Yes, it is tasty. <laughs> um, nice selection, Julie. The tastes, and by taste I mean sweet, sour, and we talk about tannin and structure. So where is the sweetness in this? Is this a dry wine or is it sweet? And if you're new to this, you perceive the dryness of a wine 
when you say dryness, you're talking about sugar content in the wine. Not alcohol, but actual residual sugar lingering. And that residual sugar is most often best picked up upon or perceived at the end. Oftentimes wines that are fruity, jammy, rich and robust like this, also have a little bit of a degree of alcohol. And sometimes you think it's sweet because the alcohol can kind of trick your palate into thinking it's sweet, but it's dry, it's actually dry, and you determine that on the finish. And Erica is picking up on that, Chris is picking up on that. It is definitely dry. And that dryness is also helped along by the tannin profile in this wine. So is it light tannin, medium tannin, or full tannin? And I would say certainly it has some tannin. Where do you, where do you guys place the tannin? Yeah, jammy but dry. Not crazy tannins, but the tannins, I think, contribute to the dryness too. As they linger, they're almost more back-loaded than they are front-loaded. The front is so nice and plush and inviting, it lures you in and then you get hit with this medium tannin, maybe medium plus um, tannin that is, uh, that's really present on the finish and a little bit drying, a little bit astringent. Not awfully so, and certainly nice. And what's important about tannin? From the blind tasting context, right? What does tannin tell you? Tannin comes from the skins of grapes, also from wood aging, but in a lesser way, from the seeds of grapes too. But principally, and really what we focus on with respect to blind tasting, the grape skin is where the tannin comes from. It's where the color comes from. It's where the structure sometimes comes from the wine too. And that, along with the alcohol, that Tannin element is associated then with grapes that have thicker skins. So Pinot Noir can have tannin, and it does, but it's a thinner skin grape and has less tannin profile typically than something with a thicker skin. Um, with that purplish hue, that rich kind of profile, the staining, tears, legs, tannin, robustness, jammy fruit, we're talking about a thicker skin grape varietal. Right, exactly, Erica, 100%. So that means as we start to profile this, what are we thinking? Petit Verdot, good. To not uh, Cabernet, maybe Shiraz, um, something along those lines. We could be talking Alianico, um, maybe even multiple Chano, Malbec, perhaps. Um, all varietals that have richness, thicker skins, more profile. We're not talking about Gamay, Pinot Noir. Um, we could be talking about in the tannin context, say Dolcetto or or Nebbiolo, and I don't know that this profile. I know for sure, I think, I would say almost for sure, that the profile of this wine isn't one that is necessarily Nebbiolo. It's a little bit deeper, richer, darker. And so as a result of that, we're talking about a wine that, uh, that has thicker skin. So you can, by virtue of this process, you, you eliminate things before you actually center in on guessing or finalizing your, your call for what the wine is. I don't think it's those things. So if we are saying it's not Gamay, it's not Pinot Noir, it's not Nebbiolo, well then that takes out Northern Italy up that way, it takes out Burgundy, it takes out Beaujolais, it takes out certain parts of the world and frees you up to think about other spots. So Kathy, yes, you're, uh, you're kind of with me a little bit on Alianico or Multiple Chano, that's pretty cool, Petit Verdot. And so from that perspective, Alianico, Multiple Chano, we're talking about Italy. We're talking about more of a warmer climate perspective in Italy and somewhere from the further south, central to south part of Italy. Um, Petit Verdot could also be Italy, could definitely be Virginia, could be California. Uh, more and more places are growing Petit Verdot. We've tasted one, I think, a long time ago, probably a year plus ago from uh, South America. I think we tasted an Argentine Petit Verdot. Um, we tasted Cabernet Franc down that way. Um, Candy, you're getting more of an old world profile, huh? There's more of a, a dried fruit component coming out now too, which which initially I was thinking more New World, and I think uh, that's appropriate to kind of go a little bit more Old World. It's starting to evolve in the glass more along the lines of that. One of the things we look for too, and we didn't touch on it because I just breezed past it, was the idea that uh, um, we have more acidity, generally speaking, in, in, the, um, in the Old World. So where's the acidity on this? Oh, and Alicante Boucher, yeah. It's hard to think like Julia in this context. I mean, she's, uh, 
she's tasting wines and she definitely tries to pull some fun things out for us. And she is not, uh, not beholden to the idea of a classic varietal in the blind con tasting context. She is more than happy to give us something that would be relatively obscure and abnormal for a blind tasting, which I think is what's awesome. Um, I was with uh, a bunch of students this week on uh, Tuesday night up in, uh, in New York, in Poughkeepsie. I was visiting high, the CIA, my alma mater, to do some recruiting at a career fair, and I took a couple students out for dinner, Joffrey and I, and we did a blind tasting. And um, I didn't get it right, which was exciting. It was a Tokai from New York. Um, and I said, that's the best part. Half the time, at least half the time, I'm getting them wrong, and when I get them wrong, it means I don't know the wine and I'm learning something. And so. The wily Julie, yes, helps us in our educational pursuits by giving us things that we don't know, and that's perfectly fine. Medium acid, thank you, Chris. So medium acid, yeah, it's not crazy acidic, right? But, but I'm salivating, and I keep doing this, because underneath my tongue, I'm still salivating. And there's a counterplay between the tannin in this wine and the dryness of it, and the tannin in this wine and the acidity of it. And I think they both are supporting each other. The tannin sort of lending itself to both the dryness and to the acidity. And that certainly helps give this wine a little bit of lift. It's really interesting um, in that regard. So you've got this dry sensation toward the finish of your palate, but you're still salivating, thanks to the acidity. <clears throat> so that would say, yeah, we could be considering for sure the old world. So let's talk a little bit about what we would get in the old world um, and where we would get it. So we talked a little bit about, or I did, at least I threw out kind of a Bordeaux style of uh, varietal. We could talk about Tempranillo being a deeper, richer from the old world. We can talk about um, Garnacha, perhaps, um, Grenache, something that's based in Grenache. We can talk about Elianico, talk about Montepulciano. So if we're in the old world and we're talking about ripe, kind of warmer climate presentation, Maybe we're talking about, could we be talking about something like uh, Douro Red or Portuguese Red? And to that, to that point, is this a blend or a single varietal? And how do you tell? And a blend oftentimes will have multi-dimensions to it, or sometimes contrasting notes that are difficult to explain with one varietal. So I don't mean contrasting in a negative way. I mean that in that, gosh, uh, a silver bullet doesn't cover how you can get really ripe fruit and raisiny fruit and tart fruit. So how do you get all three of those things in one glass? Probably, potentially, a blend. Uh, if it's one pure, beautiful solo note, then it's probably a single varietal. If it's got discordant pieces, you might be at playing jazz with a trio, or more than that, a quartet, a quintet. Um, so what do you think? Is this a blend? There's some tannin, it just keeps building and building. I think it's more of a varietal. Um, we have some mixed opinion on that. Candy is saying blend. I don't know. Uh, I'm not positive on that yet. Kathy, you're at a blend, or not a blend, excuse me. Um, Eric is the same thing. It seems to be relatively dominant. It might have something else in it. Um, because it is pretty much put together, kind of consistent one thing. Um, it might have a touch of something else in it to kind of round it out, but that tannin. So tannin um, and thick skins and ripeness and warmth and red and mostly black kind of fruit. Um, so single varietal, maybe, most likely. The thing is, if it more leans more clearly toward blend, it's a little bit easier in a way, right? So if we're thinking blend, it's probably not Alianico, it's probably not Montepulciano, right? It's probably not Tempranillo it might be more like a Grenache blend. And so then we kind of venture toward the southern part of the Rhone. We could be talking about blends from, from Spain that are sort of Rhone-like blends, Grenache, Carignana, that sort of blend. We could definitely be talking about Portuguese blends in the way of Turiga Nacional and 
uh, Tinta Franca and, and grapes like that that might be found uh, as a blend. But I'm not getting that. I think there's a rusticity about the tannin here that I think is the factor of maybe one really ripe kind of structured grape. I like the Alianico idea. Um, there isn't, uh, you know, from the southern part of, of Italy and Campania, um, sometimes you'd get more of a volcan volcanic expression of, of soils there, and thus kind of a mineral element here. I'm not picking that up so much, but could it be Montepulciano? The acid here is kind of helping me check that. I think I think we're I think Italy's a good call, uh, and some of that raisiny, prune note kind of thing that's coming out now uh, would help me settle there comfortably. It's getting more barnyardy too. There's a there's a manure element here that's coming out a bit, and we are at 26 minutes, so it's time for the wine to change, <laughs> to morph, and to uh, to evolve. Sangiovese, Chris, interesting. So one thing that you can look at, and I, I don't have a white page, but um, is the wine reflecting light? The what light that comes through this wine, is it coming through in an orange fashion? That's a great tell sometimes for Sangiovese. Um, it seems a bit riper and rounder and more tannic um, than Sangiovese would be, yet you could certainly have richer, more powerful. It's definitely coming out in a more earthen way now. It was real primary, real just fruited uh, upon opening that I think um, really I thought I was headed in the new world. But in this context now, I think I'm headed old world. So yes, uh, to your point, Kathy, right there. Earthiness, more of it, enough of it, you should say, to go old world. And Kathy, with yours having been open for a while, is that earthiness really pronounced now? Because mine's certainly coming on at 27 minutes in. That hmm. Yep, there's a nice bit of structure. Persistent tannin, a youthful tannin, one that I think will subside a bit, but that for the moment is even opening and kind of being invited to, to blossom. It's, uh, hmm, it's like a sleeping bag that you've packed away. You pull it out and it starts to expand and the, the fill lofts and the tannin seems to be lofting at this point too. And candy, yeah, uh, um, more Italian than Spanish. Yep, yeah, I'm with you too. Or French. It doesn't taste French to me particularly. And well, how do you how do you know? What do you what do you know? It's that raisiny element here and that acidity and then the the type of tannin, the, the type of tannin experience. Um, it feels more Italian to me than it does French. Um, you can find things like that in in Spain. I, I, for some reason, I always like see a little bit more dark black, kind of purple black when we're talking about Spain that way. <clears throat> and this has a reddish black to it. And that takes me to Italy most times. So I don't know if that makes sense to anybody else. A lot of times the, the aromas and the tastes present in a sort of way like colors. And the place has sort of a color signature, generally speaking. And that's what I'm kind of picking up on here. So I'm thinking Southern Italy by way of a general place. Um, Southern Italy, red wine. Red grape of some thicker skin, newish, I mean, 2020, 2019. This is two to four years old, kind of a younger wine, a younger expression. What do you guys think? What's your kind of initial, initial conclusions? If we're going to Italy, um, hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable there with an Italian kind of call, 2019, 2020. Two to four years. I think I'm going to stick with Alianico, um, Campania, and a beautiful expression. Um, I would say maybe even a, a little bit more rustic. Not something that's sort of, you know, Alianico del Otrure, like higher up on that volcanic hill, but something perhaps that's just uh, ripe, a little bit lower in elevation, and um, hmm, yeah, pretty neat. Tenturier, nice. Super Tuscan candy, yeah, you know what, we could certainly be dealing with Super, super Tuscan, and, and there are single varietal Super Tuscans, you'd find more Merlot maybe there, you'd find potentially Cabernet, you'd find that blended with Sangiovese, and I don't think I'm getting much enough to, to kind of feel blend 
and um, the tannin's a bit more aggressive than I would associate with Super Tuscan and not quite as put together. So not multiple Chiano. So yeah, I'm gonna stick with Alianico. I think that's where I'll head. Um, Alianico, Italy, 2019. Tenturier, um, I can't say that I've ever tried one. I certainly think I've had it blended, but uh, never as a single varietal. And if that's the case here, then Julie would be the wiliest while ever. Um, Anybody else have anything else they want to throw? So it's a Bordeaux bottle. Chris, do you want to play the bottle? <laughs> uh, a Bordeaux bottle. And what does that mean, right? The bottle. Bordeaux bottle would be a Bordeaux varietal. So Cabernet Merlot, Petit Verdot, Cabernet Franc, Malbec, things of that sort, or bottles, or wines that oftentimes have structure and power and are meant to age for a period of time will go into a Bordeaux bottle. The sloped sided bottle is called a Burgundy bottle, more for Pinot Noir, but you'll find lighter Grenaches in there, you'll find lighter Cabernet Francs in there, lighter reds typically would find their way into those types of bottles. So the bottle shape fits kind of the idea that we're talking about a, a structured, thicker skinned, riper, warmer climate red wine. So, but I don't think it's Bordeaux. Let's stay with Italy. From Lazio, Trufaluccio. Oh, cool. Trufaluccio. Excuse me. So this is, hmm, what is this? Is this, um, this is a red wine blend, maybe blend, I don't know. It says red wine made with organic grapes. I have to look that up. Anybody want to look up this wine real quick and see what the varietals are? Um, Erica, you're saying narrow Dalva. Is that what this is? That'd be pretty cool. That's, we should have definitely considered that Nero Davila, though. Nero Davila would be a grape that has, can have what we're talking about. Right? We, we, we blended or breeze right past Nero Davila in Sicily. That would be worthwhile. I didn't pick up the same quality of um, kind of that volcanic soil that maybe you would pick up in Nero Davila, but you can get some Neros that are certainly riper and more, more fruited. This is multiple Chano, Chris. Um, Tufaliccio from Lazio, so from sort of the area around Rome, right? It's a blend. Anybody have a chance to Google that? Hmm. It's a cool wine. Multiple Chano and Cezanese. Wow. You know, for that power too, if the alcohol is correct, it's 13.5% alcohol. So I get a little bit of heat on the back end, but not a lot. Neat. This is a pretty cool wine. What a, what a fun one, right? So we're, we were on, on target with something kind of ripe Italian. Um, and that's, you know, take, take note of what you tasted and how you felt about this, um, this type of wine where you can build a profile like, all right, that acidity and that kind of tannin, that sort of rusticity, that ripe jammy fruit into that raisiny fruit. Um, and, it, you know, you, do, you, do we nail Lazio and multiple Chano blend? No. But we got regional sort of central southern Italy and red wine and kind of not. We got that part. So we're getting a lot closer. Um, what is Cezanese? Uh, I have no idea. So... <laughs> It's, it's the exciting part. I have no idea. I don't know what, it else, what else it might be or what other thing it's called, um, but it is a pretty cool varietal. And to my knowledge, um, at least by that terminology, it's the first time I've tasted it. But it could be that it has another name, and many, many other grapes have thousands of different names. So I think uh, this comes from Williams Corner. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool wine for sure. This is neat. Well, everybody. Thank you for playing along for another edition of this uh, Mystery Wine Blind Tasting and with another cool wine that um, we weren't meant to get exactly, but I think we get points and credit for getting where we got and certainly didn't get there on my own. I got there for sure with your help. Um, okay, Cezanese Commune is a red Italian grape varietal that is primarily grown in Lazio region. Has, um, wow, has three different... Um, Designated regions, controlled regions, DOCs. Huh. 
the uh, Cezanese di Afile, Cezanese di Olirano, and Cezanese di Pilio. So this is a wine that, uh, or a grape that could have its own designation, um, which is pretty cool. That means I got to do some more research and understand more about Cezanese. Uh, <laughs> but in this context, blended with Montepulciano, made for a really kind of fun, inter interesting wine that has, I think, some real legs, pun intended, for winter wine, right? This is a great winter drinking wine. You can certainly sip on and enjoy, but one I think probably per Kathy's experience this evening too, can be open a couple days. So you can have a glass, let it sit on the counter, come back to it the next day, put it in the refrigerator, pull out a glass from the refrigerator, let that come to temper temperature and then move forward with it um, and have it with those braises and those rich flavors. And so really cool, really very cool wine. Well, cheers everybody. Yes, thank you. An enjoyable wine journey, Candy. Thank you for putting it that way. That's how I feel about it too. We get to take a journey each and every time we pour something into a glass, and that glass transports us somewhere. And we don't even know where we're going. It's even more fun, because then when we finally arrive at the destination, uh, that journey part is the most enjoyable part. Whether we get it right or not, it's not anywhere near as enjoyable as the experience of tasting and smelling and sipping and swirling with all of you. So cheers to you too, Erica, and everyone else. Thank you. I will see you in a period of, of weeks as we do this again in November. And uh, for those of you who have a, a chance to get by the restaurant, I'll see you here. We have a couple of wine events coming up in November and in December. We have our, our uh, fall wine buying event, which will have about uh, 18 wines or so to taste. If you'd like, we do that in the afternoon on a Saturday uh, at the end of the month, actually at the end of this month on the 29th. I think there's some spaces available and you get to come out and taste around uh, 18 wines that I have selected uh, and Julie has selected that we found interesting, compelling, fascinating for holiday events, for functions, for just the table over the winter and the fall. Um, things that are fascinating, we're gonna have a whole table dedicated to Pinot Noir, to Pinot, excuse me. So Pinot Noir, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris, <clears throat> Pinot Meunier, um, and of course Pinot Noir. And so the, that table will be a lot of fun. And uh, if you have a chance and, and are coming out, it'd be great to see you there. And if not, I will see you back here, hopefully the next mystery wine blind tasting. Cheers. <laughs>